perhaps you should, we should get started as people will drift in and people are online and some may not be aware of this uh, University of Toronto uh, custom that we start 10 minutes after. So uh, let me begin then just a few minutes early. And of course, we are going to be looking at uh, uh, this uh, book and uh, it's all the fortunes here, Russia's war on everybody and what it means for you. So let me welcome all of you here and those people online and uh, quite a number of people online, I understand. And thank you for braving this cold, although the sun is out, so that uh, that helps. And uh, of course, I want to thank our speaker, but I want to thank our co-sponsors. Uh, and they include the series from uh, the Monk School, the IR program, the Department of Global Science, and the Federiasic uh, program. Now, if we had met a year ago uh, today, there were some warning signs. I mean, you know, we, we've talked about some of these issues, especially those who uh, are specialists, and the Biden administration predicted that there would be an invasion, but they certainly did not prevent it. And Karen and I have some uh, uh, particular uh, perspectives on that. But even if this was predicted, the magnitude of the destruction, the form that it has taken, the unhinged brutality of the Russian aggression, as well as the remarkable bravery and tenacity of Ukrainian resistance, and the relative unity of the Western response would have been hard to conceive. But here we are today, and there may be a new escalation in the works on the part of Russia. So we have an ongoing huge conflict that has shocked uh, the international system and hopefully the conscience of Western leaders. What is so essential in this kind of situation is to look at the big picture, to understand the big picture, but also the vital context and the crucial details. And so we fortunately we have not only a book, but we have uh, an extremely good speaker here, Giles, to talk to us about this he is a senior consultant at Chatham House, he is a research director of uh, complex studies at the research, uh, at the complex studies research center. And uh, I should also say that I have known uh, here for a number of years that they've appeared together on panels in uh, uh, Rome, Italy, at the NATO Defense College, uh, where we speak to senior military officers and uh, uh, to senior civil uh, servants from NATO states and associated states. And uh, it has always been a, a tremendous pleasure and privilege to be on a panel with, uh, with CARE because uh, not only is he a superb analyst, uh, a really acute and engaging uh, observer and assessor of the uh, international system in this part of the world, but also when he speaks, he uses uh, elegant English, elegant and effective English, unencumbered by the arcane and the impenetrable jargon of social sciences. It is a clarity that I particularly uh, uh, appreciate. It is always terrific to listen to Kerry Giles. It is quite a tall order to be the one who follows him and uh, try to uh, even remotely match uh, his, uh, his eloquence and uh, uh, his acute analysis. And so today we are going to welcome Kerry Giles uh, and uh, uh, he will speak for 45 minutes and then we will open up to questions uh, uh, and answers both on uh, uh, in person and uh, and online. So it is again very much my pleasure to introduce uh, my uh, colleague, Kerry Giles. Thank you, Earl. Thanks for coming, everybody, and thanks for tuning in, people online. Those were very kind words, but they also got me thinking about what if we had done this a year ago. And it might surprise people, but a year ago, this book was already written. <laughs> 
the first time this book was finished was in October 2021, well before the invasion was launched, because the issues that it talks about in terms of Russia waging war against all of us long predated February 2022. These are permanent, permanent steady state issues. And in fact, some of the things that Oral talked about as being uh, unpredictable, I think we could still see coming in these presentations that we've done together at NATO Defense College in Italy, talking to the baby generals of NATO as they gather together to learn how to be senior officers. One of the slides that I have not had to change before and after the invasion, the new invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, is the one about the Russian way of war. And the prediction that I had made on each of these seminars going back years that when and if it came to open conflict in Europe, we shouldn't expect any departure by Russia from the levels of bestial savagery that their troops have displayed in previous conflicts. So we knew this stuff and we knew that this was coming. And the problem was we could say it as often as we liked but it was incredibly hard to believe for people who were not as imbued in the culture of Russia and who did not believe Russians themselves when they explained what their country wanted and how they wanted to go about getting it. So you might ask, well, what was I writing about in October 2021 if the war hadn't started? There was a process of rewriting the book, supposedly rewriting the book after the war was actually launched. The publishers did me a favor by sitting on this for four months. And it was mostly changing they will do this into they are doing this because it had been a warning about the fact that these two incompatible world systems that we see in Russia and in the West could not resolve their differences and this would inevitably lead to an open clash to using that open clash as an example and as the highlight of all of the other different conflicts that are playing out around the world in all of the other domains other than open military conflict. I suppose the difference now is that this is more believable for people because it has been demonstrated exactly what Russia will do and what Russia wants. And that is the reason why this book is dedicated to Vladimir Putin, because he has made our job of explaining Russia vastly easier. We are no longer disbelieved. We no longer have to argue uphill about the nature of this country and of this regime and of its aims and what it wants from the rest of the world and of the methods that it will use to get what it wants. So we can now spend our time instead of having that argument, actually thinking more about what to do about it and what comes next, which is a much more productive use of our time. But here we see a problem. I talked about the reason why we were not believed before, because it is so hard to believe, because People generally in Western liberal democracies, even the decision makers and policy makers tend to have an innate faith in human nature, and they tend to be guided far more than they should be by optimism, which is the perennial bugbear of Russia watchers because it is inevitably misplaced. The way optimism is influencing predictions of Russia's future at the moment, and as a, as a result of that, the policy prescriptions for how to deal with it, is the way people are thinking about the end of hostilities in Ukraine, eventually, whatever form that may take, and what comes after this. And we're hearing more and more a consensus that things will be better once the war has ended, and there will be opportunities, possibly to resurrect a relationship with Russia that if you are in France or Germany and making policy, you seem to think of as some mythical golden age of peace before February 2022. But it's a widespread, widespread consensus. The day before I flew to North America on this trip, I had a, a phone call from the defense and security editor of a national newspaper who was collecting quotes for an article about the longer term prospects for the relationship with Russia, what happens after the war. And he started his pitch with the line that he had got from all of the other experts and policy people and academics that he had spoken to. He said, so when Russia is defeated, and Putin is overthrown, and Russia breaks up, what happens next? And it took some time to persuade him that actually this was not as inevitable as he had been told, and it was certainly not going to happen in the time frame that he was thinking about. And to his credit, he did admit this. But the problem is, there is that widespread view that things are going to get better. The problem is, the future of 
at least Euro-Atlantic security, if not world security, depends on the future state of Russia. And the future state of Russia depends on the outcome of the armed conflict in Ukraine at the moment, which means we have a huge range of different possible futures. The problem is in none of them is Russia not a threat and a problem and a challenge to the West. And that is regardless of whether, is, whether Russia is strong or weak according to our criteria. The only thing that varies is the nature and the imminence of the threat and how exactly Russia presents a challenge to our security and our order. And that is because of Russia's own assumptions about its place in the world and its relationship with the rest of the world. And that includes that deep-rooted hostility and view of the permanence of conflict that Russia displays, augmented by its zero-sum view of security, something I delved into in great depth in the previous book of this one, called Moscow Rules, subtitle, What Drives Russia to Confront the West? And this was at a time, even just three years ago, when it was quite hard to argue that Russia was driven to confront the West, despite the weight of historical evidence. That book was about the why Russia attacks. This is about the how Russia attacks. There's still a little bit of why in it, of course. It looks at the way that Russia reaches out to cause harm and damage to our nations and our societies and individuals, either to expand Russian power and influence, whether it's through direct control, as in the case of Ukraine, or also just to influence political and democratic processes in order to expand the range of what Russia can get away with, making sure that Russia isn't obstructed in advance or possibly not punished after the fact of doing something that ought to be unacceptable to the international community. But also, and this is a theme that comes through very strongly in this book in particular, sometimes Russia can reach out just to cause harm to the adversary country, the adversary society. Because in a zero-sum view of security, anything that it does to damage the perceived adversaries, whether or not that adversary is actually aware that they are in a confrontation with Russia, by comparison, makes Russia stronger. And that is what means when we are asked sometimes to look for the motivation behind the Russian attacks that we've seen playing out, not just over the last year, but over the last decade. Sometimes we have to explain that these motivations are trivial or non-existent. It could be as a result of reputational damage, for instance, for example, the, the cyber attacks on the World Anti-Doping Agency or the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons because they have access to information that makes Russia look bad. It can be simply out of spite if you attack the Tokyo Olympics simply because you're not invited to it, or it can be just to do damage. And the classic example of that is the way, even before we were faced with a global pandemic, Russia was sponsoring and facilitating anti-vaccine movements around the world because it suited Russia to have other countries suffering a public health crisis. And the cynicism behind that approach was only emphasized by the way, once coronavirus hit, those efforts were stepped up and more resources were poured into them to try to undermine the responses of other countries around the world to this immediate emergency. So Ukraine is at the moment the most obvious instance of this conflict. It's the most obvious example of how this difference between these worldviews plays out and what the results are. But this book is about the other war. It's about the broader war, the longer war, the war that has been replaying out in always short of actual open military clashes with the West, because that has been the one thing that Russia has tried very hard to avoid because it knows that the results would be catastrophic for Moscow. And that war has gone by a lot of different names over time. It's been called hybrid, it's been called gray zone, liminal, sub-threshold. All of these different methods of warfare seem to be distinguished from what we have playing out in Ukraine, largely by who is actually running the war on behalf of Moscow. In Ukraine, it is largely the armed forces, the Ministry of Defense, the general staff, the people who you might think ought to be in charge of a war. Elsewhere and over the past decade, it has been Russia's security and intelligence services that instead have been reaching out to cause damage elsewhere. In all of the different forms that they've been doing so, which in many cases have been indistinguishable from acts of war across Europe, North America, and further afield. 
It's included things like cyber attacks, like use of chemical weapons, like targeted assassinations, all of these things already in play. Some of them now we see resurrected from Cold War days when Russia similarly mounted campaigns of subversion and destruction against the West. If you've been watching the media reporting lately, you may have seen a suggestion that mail bomb attacks in Spain against Ukrainian targets are the first inkling of a resurrection of organized terror groups sponsored and facilitated by Russia to cause mayhem in Western capitals. Something that I pointed out in this book had not yet happened again, but probably soon would. But all of these means of doing harm that are described in this book, all of these means of reaching out and touching people are probably going to get worse, not better, once the active phase of the fighting in Ukraine comes to an end. Because Russia will have confirmed for itself its most cherished paranoid delusion that the entire West is arrayed against it because it sees Western support for Ukraine as a means of frustrating Russia's legitimate interest to enslave the Ukrainian nation and cause it to cease to exist. In addition, those security and intelligence services will have something to prove. They need to resurrect their reputation. They need to regain their place at court because it is they, of course, who contributed to the disastrous early phases of Russia's war on Ukraine in 2022 by getting the intelligence picture so spectacularly wrong. And what better way could they be to redeem their reputation than actually to mount the campaign again against the West only even more dramatically? And finally, of course, all of the resources that are currently engaged in Ukraine in the behind the lines campaigns of assassinations and sabotage and poisonings disguised as alcohol abuse, all of those will be released to once again turn their attentions to Western capitals. So unfortunately, this intense period of fighting in Ukraine itself is accompanied by a temporary lull in activities elsewhere, at least those that reach it into public reporting, but I think this is not going to last. And the main thrust of this book is that it is real people that suffer as a result. It is individuals, it is human beings with families leading ordinary lives because this is not an abstraction. This is not something that happens on solely a governmental level. It affects everyone. The real people are on the front line and they can arrive there either deliberately or completely by surprise. Now, some people set themselves up in opposition to Russia. Some of them are in the room today and they suffer the consequences as a result. They see what Russia likes, they don't like it. And so they try to resist it and they feel the full force of Russia's state against them. Others, are surprised, they're just doing their job. They may be law enforcement officials, they may be soldiers, they may be diplomats, and they're not expecting the kind of attention that they get from Russia because it doesn't fit within the norms of civilized behavior between states. And then there's a third category, and it's at that third category that this book is aimed. It's the people who had no interest in Russia whatsoever until they discovered entirely unsuspectingly that they were a target that they were in Russia's crosshairs for some kind of intervention which has impact, impacted their lives. Now that intervention takes a lot of different forms. There is a huge range, a huge range of scale of impact of what Russia does that you can feel if you are on the receiving end. At one extreme, you can be in Ukraine. Your apartment block can be destroyed by a Russian missile. Your life can be destroyed. Your friends, your family, all can be killed. At the other extreme, you may not even notice the indirect effects of what Russia is doing, but it costs you all the same. It may simply cost you in your pocket. If, for example, you are a Canadian taxpayer, who do you think foots the bill for the massive cyber attacks on GAC, for example, that cause their systems to have to be burned to the ground and rebuilt? cyber attacks launched from Russia. Or ransomware, where does the ransom money come from? The capital is siphoned out of Western societies and delivered into Moscow, where let's not forget some of the headquarters of the ransomware gangs are in the same glitzy office block as the Ministry of Digital Communications. Or organized crime working again to draw capital out of our societies and deliver it into Moscow. All of those hit people in the pocket, whether they are recognizing it or not. So there is this enormous 
scale. There is this enormous range. And where people sit on them is entirely down to their own personal circumstances and how much they have annoyed Russia. That really tells us a great deal about the range of tools which Russia can actually deploy against people. It can be as something as simple as online abuse, which most of us have suffered one time or another, which can be either trivial or actually highly impactful, because we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which they can have a chilling effect if you do suffer a mass troll attack. It can be targeted cyber attacks. It can be something which impacts your actual personal economic livelihood. You can be doxxed. You can have your personal details released online in order that not only your private information is released, but you invite further physical attacks. It can be home intrusions and invasions, which we've seen playing out not just in Russia, but also across Western societies. And so on and so on, right up until if you really annoy Russia, then you are likely to be the subject of a targeted assassination. On the flight over here, I actually shared the flight with a, a very respected and trusted colleague working at another London think tank who has been conducting far more targeted and focused investigations into specific ways in which Russia is prosecuting its war efforts, and as a result is getting people in the West arrested. He knows he is a target. He enjoys his job immensely and is continuing, but he knows he has to amend his lifestyle in order to make sure that the risk to himself and to his family, who are also always targeted, is minimized. This is a very real and a very present threat. And the key point that I wanted to get across in this book is that it is everybody. That's why the book doesn't focus on the usual suspects that you might see being interviewed in a book of this kind. It's not just the generals, the politicians, the diplomats, the ministers, the people who are at the top of managing the response to Russia. Instead, it's people who I hope most of them you would never have actually heard of. Because it is those ordinary people that have kept in eyewitness interviews from, again, whether or not they expected to be in Russia's crosshairs, the effect that they found of just being targeted by Russia. So there are in here 40 eyewitnesses, from more than a dozen countries on four continents around the world because this is a truly global problem. And I did that to illustrate two of the key things of the book. First of all, nobody is too unimportant to be a target. But secondly, also, and this is particularly relevant when touring, for example, North America, nobody is immune because they are too far away. Now, besides cyber, there's another way in which uh, Russia does reach out and touch people using the Internet. And that, of course, is the disinformation campaigns, the way in which Russia promotes conspiracy theories and also false narratives about its own behavior in places which are far, far away from the direct targets of Russian action. Last week, I had a, uh, one of my regular radio call ins an interview on a South African radio talk show. For them, it's a distant conflict, and yet they experience, the radio presenters there experience precisely the same level of people who have been deluded down a conspiracy theory rabbit hole to believe the 180 degree opposite of everything that is playing out in Europe. They have to push back against that just as hard as people who are in the frontline states. And this is a country which has no stake in the conflict whatsoever, and if it does have a stake, it's currently deciding which side of the conflict it's on. It's an illustration of how each country around the world has its own specific sets of vulnerabilities that Russia can exploit. And Russia does look very carefully at which vulnerabilities it can exploit. That's not only in terms of where the vulnerability is through societal means or political or democratic processes or information vacuums. It's also the key issues that Russia can reach in and touch on in order to stir up conflict within that society. Again, sometimes solely with the aim of setting different parts of society against each other in order that societal cohesion is threatened and the country as a whole becomes weaker. Sometimes people ask us, well, does that really not have any end game at all? Is it just to set up conflict? But we like to use the example of the early stages of the February invasion of Ukraine to illustrate what the end state of that precisely might be. 
The resistance to Russia's new invasion within Ukraine has been an astonishing feat, not only of resilience, but also of societal cohesion. Now consider if Russia's campaigns that are specifically targeting the cohesion of society and trust in institutions and people working together against a common problem had been successful in the way that Russia wants them to be, then the war in Ukraine would have been far more of a foregone conclusion in the manner that Russia wanted it to be. And that is the same of campaigns that we see playing out in so many different countries around the world, targeting these trigger issues to make sure that people do not trust each other and do not work together. Every country has its own trigger issues. The targets in the United States tend to be race issues and guns. In the UK, it's Brexit. Across Europe, it's migration. And in each of these key issues, there are specific ways of reaching in with the long screwdriver and attacking those fault lines in order to set up conflict. Now, there's a common factor to all of these campaigns, no matter which country Russia is aiming them at, and that is the local enablers. Because Russia can't achieve nearly as much as it does, whether in information space or in physical activities, without the active cooperation of facilitators in those target countries, who, for a range of different motivations, have chosen to work against their own country on behalf of Russia. Now, in the book, I look into some of those motivations, and it's interesting that they coincide with what's described in the literature as classic motivators for conducting espionage. It's money. It's ideology. It's compromise. It's ego. And ego is the biggest one as we look at the damaged personalities that generally tend to gravitate towards working as Russian propagandists. But there's also a range of different ways in which they can work for the hostile power. Some of them are public and open and declared. For example, if you work for RT or Sputnik, you are working for an organization whose managing director described it as a tool of information warfare against the West. And if you're not paying attention to that, you're really not doing your job as a so-called journalist. Or you can be a head of state or a leader of the government who pushes through Russia-friendly policies while you're in office, and then as soon as you're out of office, you immediately move to lucrative positions with Russian companies, something that has been replicated across the Euro-Atlantic space again and again, because it is perfectly legal. That's in the public space. Others are public and undeclared, such as the, the journalists and the academics and the public figures who disseminate Russian disinformation and the false justifications for Russian actions in order to seed them into the information space that we all occupy, in order, once again, to try to provide that permissive environment for what Russia does. Some of those are extremely high profile, like the pro-Russian voices on social media, but the most dangerous of all of these individuals are the covert influences, the agents of influence who are consciously working on behalf of Russia or indeed of any other hostile power who sit behind closed doors in the conversations with government where policy is made, where they can provide to the decision makers and the policy makers, sometimes at a very senior level, exactly the recommendations for what to do about Russia that Russia wants them to hear. We see this process playing out as long-term Russia watches. We know who these individuals are. Sometimes we know precisely the advice they're giving and to whom. Maybe we're in the same room. Maybe we see it just regurgitated in public policy later, or sometimes, most alarmingly, in statements by very senior military officers repeating precisely the lines that we heard previously. The problem is, in so many cases, there is absolutely nothing that can be done about it. Because the perception of threat from subversion in most Western countries at this point is still not sufficiently developed to actually make it something that is illegal or even challenged by most arms of government. The nature of subversion remains unchanged, even if there are different ways by which it can be delivered now that we have the advantage of all of the tools and levers that can be de deployed remotely across the internet. What has changed is the awareness of the threat. During the Cold War, 
most uh, nations and in fact most societies were fully aware of the threat and therefore were empowered to guard against it. Those defenses in most cases have fallen. The exception tends to be, as it so often is, the frontline states, the ones most directly under threat of cross-border effects from Russia, who see the threat and can deal with it appropriately. Most of the rest of the West is entirely wide open. And there's a case study that is very current and to do with operations in Ukraine at the moment that we can use to illustrate precisely what the impact of campaigns like this is drawing on not only the direct policy inputs that are delivered by agents of influence, but also the long-standing campaigns of information preparation of the battle space that Russia has undertaken. And I'm talking about the inculcation of the fear of escalation in Western leaderships. The way in which all of Russia's propagandists and influencers and useful idiots and agents of influence and media and public diplomacy have for over a decade been seeding one single idea with great intensity and great effort. The idea that if you impede or offend Russia in any way, this will lead to, quote, miscalculation. Miscalculation <clears throat> will lead to escalation. Escalation will lead to open clashes. Open clashes between Russia and a NATO nation will lead to nuclear exchanges, and that in turn will lead to World War III. The problem is that has been so successfully seeded and it has percolated through the debate in Western countries so effectively that it now forms the foundation for practically every conversation about it. And if you don't believe me, look at the conversations about escalation, about the threat of nuclear war between, say, today, and 15 years ago, and don't necessarily think about the presence of an active conflict. Instead, look at the starting points for the conversation, the baseline assumptions for what would actually be required for a nuclear war and the Third World War. And you will see how those have been affected over time by this intensive Russian campaign. The problem is it's permeated the debate absolutely, totally, and it's now having a direct impact on lives in Ukraine. Because it is that idea that you cannot offend or impede Russia that drives people to put the brakes on the supplies to Ukraine of the critical capabilities that they need to bring this war to a close. And so it drags on at immense cost. This conviction that it is only Russia that it can escalate. And so the task of Western countries is no longer escalation management as once it might have been, but is now escalation avoidance at all costs, is what causes countries like the United States to feel forward carefully, to calibrate their response, to look for those red lines that they have been told again and again, Russia has put in place in order to make sure that it is safe for them to deliver capabilities to Ukraine. And of course, at each occasion when they encounter them, those red lines evaporate because they are based on an information campaign rather than Russia's real intent and even sometimes on Russia's real capabilities. But still, this immensely successful information operation still brings benefits for Russia and we still see Western countries constraining themselves from recognizing the reality of the war that Russia has unleashed. There are two specific ways I'd like to think about that. First, the ban effectively on Ukraine striking into Russia, the constraints on weapon systems delivered to Ukraine so that it cannot carry out cross border strikes, conspires in Russia's fiction that it is not at war, that it is conducting a special military operation which is beyond its borders, and it insulates Russia's population for the consequences of the reactions of its leadership. And therefore, it plays Russia's game by Russia's rules because Russia's leadership can continue in this fiction. Similarly, the Russian campaign of destruction of critical civilian infrastructure with Ukraine, the idea of causing Ukraine to capitulate through triggering a humanitarian catastrophe on a massive scale, replicating the successful tactics that Russia deployed in Syria beforehand on a much, much larger scale 
depends on nobody actually impeding it. Depends on everybody playing this game by Russia's rules, by accepting that Russia has the right to do this as a form of 21st century warfare and responding to it by trying to patch up Ukrainian infrastructure as rapidly as Russia is destroying it, or by shipping in anti-air defense weapon systems, instead of addressing the problem at its cause. And if this is not an acceptable behavior for a nation state in the 21st century, making it plain to that nation state that there will be consequences if it continues. Why does this not happen? Because once again, of this immensely successful campaign of reflexive control to convince Western countries that this is impossible, that you cannot have that kind of conversation with Russia because it is a nuclear power. That is, as I mentioned, a case study, and it's just one among many in this book of the ways in which not only Russia is waging this war, but also in many cases, it is waging it unopposed. Another good example is the way in which Russia is conducting, in effect, open cyber warfare against the West, but it is not recognized as such by Western countries. I mentioned the ransomware, I mentioned the destructive attacks. The best illustration of an objective appraisal of what is happening in cyberspace actually comes not from governments, but from insurance companies. There's a paradox because insurers are fighting against paying out for major incidents like the NordPetya incidents in 2017, fighting against paying out billions of dollars because they have assessed that these are in fact acts of war. Governments can't say that because they have political constraints. Primarily, if you admit that you have suffered an act of war, you actually have to do something about it. So there's a strong incentive to pretend it's not happening. But at a massive scale, economy, has shown that actually the war is underway. There's Mondelez, the, the food company, suing Zurich insurers for $100 million. There's Merck Pharmaceuticals suing their insurers for $1.4 billion because the insurers have pointed out that this is a state-sponsored act of war. And therefore, the war exclusions that we all have in our insurance policies apply, so they're not gonna pay out. Key fact being, of course, that that war decision, that decision of whether we are at war by insurance companies is based on an objective appraisal of the facts, as opposed to whether there has been an open declaration of hostilities. So if you have an attack by or on behalf of a sovereign power which causes this extent of damage, they are absolutely clear that this war has been ongoing for some time. As indeed is Russia. It may come as a surprise to people when they look at the current state of what Russians are told by their country and by their media about what has been happening with the West over the last decade or more. But they are in absolutely no doubt that this war with the West has been ongoing. The tragic consequence of that is that you now have a generation of young soldiers who are fighting in Ukraine who have known nothing other than this relentless propaganda about already being in a conflict with the West led by the United States. Where do you go from there? The bottom line is that no matter what the resolution, temporary resolution of the conflict in Ukraine that everybody looks forward to as something that would actually change the situation, no matter what that may be, Russia is not going to go away. And that that Western nations, no matter whether they think they're insulated by distance from the problem or not, will need to continue to protect their society and their citizens over the long term. I would really be happy if progress had been made and parts of this book were, were by now redundant, but we have far too far to go. And as I mentioned earlier, the roots of this behavior are long-term and go back centuries in Moscow, as I described in the previous book. What it means is that it is not going to change overnight. Russia is always going to be a threat and a challenge unless and until not only the political leadership, but also Russian society as a whole is given an incentive to change. And that incentive can only come about as it has done repeatedly throughout previous Russian history in the form of a disastrous defeat, which makes clear that Russia had made a catastrophic strategic blunder, 
and that its means of projecting power is not appropriate for the 21st century, and neither is the reason why it projected power in the first place. What that means is that Ukraine <coughs> can bring about change by setting the limits to Russian power and demonstrating that the era of land empires in Europe is past and that Russia can no longer use its power in the ways to which it has been accustomed. What that means is that Ukraine is fighting for us all because the course and outcome of the war in Ukraine is existential, not just for that country, but it's also critical for the future security of the entire free world. I will end there and I'm greatly looking forward to the conversation and discussion. Well, uh, thank you very much for this vital and sobering analysis where we get a, a really crucial picture of the cost uh, of Russian aggression, just as we sometimes do not understand the cost of international terrorism. And we all pay a price for that. And this is why this book is so important. The publisher uh, has run out of copies uh, a little while ago, but there are new additional copies that are available. We were just sent a notice that uh, those who are here, they can order from Bloomsbury and you will get a 20% discount. And so uh, uh, I think it would be uh, important for people to read exactly what is in this work. I should just add very briefly before we open the questions that on the panels, and we have done this for a number of years at uh, NATO, where Terry and I uh, would uh, speak to the senior officers and civil servants. Until the Russian invasion, we had two Russian representatives. Uh, and uh, one of them, especially, was very effective in manipulating the audience. And the audience, or, and of course, members, these were people who were members, military and, 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 and civilian. Uh, and so this was done uh, in the open. The falsification of history, this kind of reflexive control of playing on key elections, on fears. Uh, and it could be effective in some of these uh, seminar and breakout sessions. We had to do some cleaning up uh, uh, afterwards where, uh, when we were speaking to these uh, smaller, uh, smaller groups. But uh, I had argued uh, uh, on a number of these sessions that you know, Russia, which has so much potential to become a successful state, and in many ways, Russia is a failed state under Vladimir Putin. Uh, he has done enormous damage to Ukraine and to the world, but he has done tremendous damage to the Russian people themselves. They, they may not understand it, but he has been a disaster for Russia. And I had suggested that Russia, with all those natural resources, with this tremendous human talent, could become a very successful state like Germany or Japan by focusing on domestic issues, cultivating their own garden, so to speak. And the reply to that was, no, no, we are a unique, indispensable global power. So we may not be a superpower, but we need to have this external influence, which was, as here pointed out, this kind of binary uh, approach. And I remember when I pressed him on it, he said, no, no, we would not want to become like Japan or Germany. And these are two stable, exemplary, and spectacularly successful democracies. He said, no, no, we don't want to come like that because we have not been defeated. And perhaps mm -hmm. what you said, defeat might have a really salutary effect in the case of what is happening in Ukraine. And this is why uh, the outcome on the ground is so absolutely crucial. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to open up the floor for questions. And could you please identify yourself? And we will also look to see uh, uh, the questions that may be coming in online. So please uh, go ahead. Anyone? Yes. Anybody I'll start off with a question. Yeah, my name is George Hannes. Uh, I attend with these various uh, sessions here at uh, Ceres, the Biotech Fairmont Center, and I'm particularly interested in uh, Central Europe and uh, Russia as well. And of course, interested in the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, your presentation uh, uh, here is, uh, is, is 
initiated a lot of questions uh, for me to ask. I'll only ask two. I'm sure, other people have other questions. One is uh, the whole issue of sanctions, which were started by the uh, the West uh, at the beginning of the war. It's now a year um, since the war started. Are they starting to have an impact on the society on the average Russian? So that's one question. The other question is um, regarding uh, the um, cyber attacks by Russia on the West and the use of these various uh, uh, IT groups for ransomware and the cyber attacks. What is the West doing to counter those attacks? Uh, we hear about the attacks from Russia. We hear nothing about uh, counterattacks from uh, from Western uh military establishment or the Western governments to undermine the Russian uh, system. Okay. Thanks. Yes, uh, first of all, as I just mentioned, the, the, the book has been sold out in um, in Canada and the US since uh, since launch, but it, we are told this morning that it is now available directly from the Canadian distributor, and I tested that barcode earlier on, it does work. So if you think this is interesting, that seems to be the one route to get it at the moment, because I'm sorry, this call was spoken for, and this is the last one available in North America. So um, sanctions uh, and the impact. First of all, the, the essential disclaimer, I'm not an economist. So on this, I have to I have to lean on those people who are economists and whose judgment I trust and who say that the uh, the ways in which Russia has been able to avoid some of the worst intended impacts of sanctions by leveraging energy revenue, particularly by all of the energy that has gone to, to Europe still over the course of the last year, is only a temporary solution to the long-term impact of sanctions. And of course, it was a long-term impact that was had in mind. So yes, there will be uh, immediate and obvious changes in the quality of life of people within Russia, but not ones that will actually be um, substantially impacting their lives yet but the the challenges to to russia maintaining its economy will become harder and harder over time whether or not that actually has the effect of, uh, of influencing the russian behavior and russian state behavior of course is an entirely different question because as i'm sure everybody in this room will know and accept the um, the historical precedent is for the population of Russia in whatever form it has taken to be quite able to withstand prolonged falls in its standard of living to levels that would be absolutely intolerable in Western liberal democracy and still not bring about political change until the final moment when something snaps and everything moves very fast. So I hope that um, there are, I know in, in the early stages, people were looking, some people were looking to sanctions for bringing about some kind of persuasion of Russia to change its political course. I hope that no longer, nobody is hoping that for any longer. Instead, it is the, the long-term driving home of the message that this is not a way in which countries conduct themselves in the 21st century, but it is still obviously not gonna have anything like the impact of the direct clash in Ukraine, especially if that provides a major setback for Russia. So sanctions are essential, but not the whole of the answer. And on uh, cyber, the countermeasures, well, there's a good reason why um, cyber offensive capabilities in Western countries are, are deeply, deeply classified. Um, so we cannot see what is happening. I mean, in a way, that provides something of an advantage, because if you can have a conversation with a country like Russia about the costs and countermeasures that you are going to impose on them if they do not stop a certain course of behavior, there is an advantage to that happening under the table and in a way that is not publicly visible because you can have the frank conversation without impinging on issues like the country losing face and needing to retaliate. So I like to think that there is a lot going on that they simply do not see in terms of activity directed in the other direction. Some of the things that we can um, see, of course, are not only the countermeasures that we see urged on all of our side, which primarily is in the case of, uh, is um, closing off the vulnerabilities by insisting on better cybersecurity and better protection for ourselves. And as we know, if you make yourself a hard target, Russia looks elsewhere. But there are also initiatives like uh, what was referred to as the, the Cyber Deterrence Initiative, which is primarily an exercise in what some people call naming and shaming, and therefore tend to discount it because you can name Russia as the perpetrator 
But if you are dealing with a country that is impervious to shame, that doesn't have quite the same impact. Nevertheless, when you expose Russian capabilities in a manner which uh, Western countries, and in particular, the cybersecurity providers that work with them, have been more willing to do over recent years than they were in the past, you neutralize those capabilities. If you issue indictments against specific Russian military intelligence officers that have been launching cyber attacks against Western countries, it's not with the hope of ever bringing them to justice. But if you expose their personalities and their methods and the means by which they carry out their attacks, then that raises awareness across the board and it neutralizes those people and those methods for carrying out future attacks. So cyber is one of the key areas where throughout this book I have been arguing, in fact I've been arguing for a long time, for greater openness by Western countries about the kind of attacks that are delivered against them by Russia. By stepping away from this reticence about the campaigns that are going on in the hidden domain in part because there is this complicity of silence between Russia and the target country. I think that that is not only morally wrong, but also deeply counterproductive in terms of societies defending themselves because it is a whole of society threat. And because since we're blessed in by living in Western liberal democracies, we also have the challenge that our countries are completely unable to defend themselves against threats about which the majority of the population are simply unaware. Because if they don't know it's a problem, they are not going to vote for programs that devote resources to solving it. So greater awareness, I've consistently argued, is a, a first stage enabler to defense against some of these challenges. And less of an, in, uh, an instinct to conceal what is going on, I think, is absolutely vital by Western countries. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm Michael Shirley. I'm a MA student with Saris, um, researching uh, the use of Wagner in, in the war of Ukraine, particularly after the invasion. Uh, but I wanted to ask you uh, about this fear of escalation and what role does this play for actors who are not necessarily in the Western camp. So does this incentivize a country such as Turkey, despite NATO membership, China, Iran to appease or to work closer with Russia? Does this Is this a factor in those calculations? It seems not to be. And I, I touched briefly on the way in which Russia tailors its campaigns and its effects to the different audiences. And uh, the the way in which this plays in the third countries, and bizarrely, even though it's a NATO member, we, we need to count Turkey among these third countries, is um, it emphasizes the danger of uh, nuclear war as a result of the actions of the irresponsible West. But at the same time, it allows those countries to sit back and say, this is not our problem and it is not our fight. And that is what enables them, of course, to, uh, in some cases, reap the benefits that they can from. Uh, Russia looking to other partners in the West now has torpedoed its relationship with uh, with the Euro Atlantic community, and in other cases simply to ignore what is going on. All of that is because Russia has uh, presented the information campaigns to those countries in a manner which allows it not to look like the irresponsible party. And one of the most spectacular um, results of that, one of the most counterintuitive results of that, is the way. Russia's campaigns for influence in Africa have been sufficiently successful that those countries which were at threat of starvation as a result of Russian grain blockades didn't blame Russia for that happening. So yes, these campaigns have effects around the world, but those effects are actually very different because Russia looks at where the most profitable line of information operation is going to be and takes that instead of a blanket across the board approach. The gentleman in the back, you and was up and then. Hi, uh, my name is Nick. Um, I'm, I'm into data and software, but uh, I do research a lot of the World War II uh, later history. And I think it's a, Sorry, a bit louder so we can. Oh, yeah. So uh, I do research a lot of World War II related history, and you did have a uh, talk about Stalingrad and, and the myth making about Stalingrad. So uh, I just wanted to. Uh, Basically, two questions I had, but I wanted to preface that by just uh, 
based on a book about uh, Moscow is going back to uh, the beginnings of Russia. I know I'll tell you why I'm saying that later. But uh, if you really begin with the start of, like, say, the Golden Gold, way, way back, centuries ago, and, and then uh, the, uh, the paranoia that surrounds all people that govern or rule Russia since then, um, you take it further away, like take it to Peter the Great and things that come to it. Um, it's that, that thing that you also mentioned in the book is about uh, the people just having, I mean, they need to just follow orders from somebody who's a Russian citizen and then, and then just do, uh, I mean, they're, they're not citizens, like you said, they're subjects, which is a critical difference between like liberal democracies and, and Russia and and like you know, why they do not want to be like Germany or Japan at, at that point. Um, and then it, it's easy. To, and when once you have a myth making like Stalingrad, and then you have a sort of a uh, modified stab in the back myth uh, uh, into Russia, which can which which leads to we were never defeated kind of thing uh, in in World War II, like Ger that happened in Germany. I'm just trying to extrapolate that to Russia. Uh, do you think? Uh, a sort of a denazification that happened in Germany or a version of that that happened in Japan. Not really because of the Korean War, but denazification did not happen in Japan. Uh, but would that kind of uh, approach by Western democracies, is it plausible, possible? Uh, would countries now, because I mean, people aren't even willing to uh, escalate uh, violence. And, and like you said, you clearly mentioned, like it's not just information warfare. They're also showing, okay, if you if you stand against us, we destroy your cities like Mariupol uh, or Bakhmut or for instance. So, so it's not, I mean, they're showing it literally on TV. Uh, so what, is it possible that the entire population uh, can get denazified in a way? Like, I don't know what word to use, but de and you show fight in a way. Yes, uh, yes to everything you said in the early stages about the uh, the way in which Russia's retarded societal development means that these are subjects, not citizens, with all that goes with that. And unfortunately, it is hard to say sometimes in an academic setting, but it is that retarded societal development that leads to Russian soldiers displaying behaviors in Ukraine that are not recognizably human. There is no other way around it because you talked about the difference between Russia and Western liberal democracies. Russia simply has not been through many of the transformative events that make Western countries democracies. And a classic example of this, of course, is bound up with the, um, the Russian emphasis on control of information because information is a threat. And it is not just in recent times that, uh, that Russia has clapped down on ideas and opinions coming from outside or news coming from the outside world because that is a problem. And the classic example that, uh, that's been pointed out to me by a much cleverer colleague is looking at events like the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the Reformation that simply failed to happen in Russia. Um, he said, consider the, the impact of this restriction on information. Look at the development of the printing press, or rather the arrival of the printing press in, and its spread across Western Europe and how that led to a revolution in knowledge and how that led to a revolution in society. Now consider if at the time, all of the princes and bishops that were in charge had seen instead information as a threat and they had had to control absolutely everything that was developed by a printing press and made sure there were very few of them. The Renaissance would never have happened. And that is precisely what the situation is in Russia where the societal retardation as a result of the leadership seeing its own internal population as a threat, as well as the external threats, which sometimes are real, sometimes are completely imaginary, means that we are dealing with a challenge from another age. And unfortunately, we have to adjust accordingly. So denazification is not a bad shorthand for the kind of societal transformation that would need to happen within Russia for Russia not to be a threat and a challenge to the rest of the world in the way that it is today. Is it realistic? Unfortunately, not because there might possibly have been a fleeting opportunity at the end of the Cold War, but Russia didn't go through 
um, the same process that other countries who achieved a more or less peaceful transformation did. Take, for example, um, let's go back to South Africa again. After 1994, you have the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions that actually are honest and open about what happened, the crimes of both sides that were opposed under the previous regime. That never happened in, in Russia. Russia clings to the idea of the Nuremberg trials at the end of Nazi Germany as a legitimation of the current world order. Why did they do this? Because the Nazi regime had the Nuremberg trials, the Soviet regime never did. And yet these two regimes were so similar that in Russia now it is illegal to compare the two. There are so many points of contact between them that you're not allowed to mention. Nobody would outlaw comparing black and white, and yet these two are so close together that they have to pass a law to make sure nobody mentions it. Denazification in the case of Germany and Japan, well, yes, there's the crucial missing ingredient that you had to actually occupy the country and so it, it inflict not only a severe military defeat, but also make sure that its entire political system was uprooted. It was re-educated over the course of generations in order to try to remove those seeds of destruction that lay in those societal attitudes. Now, nobody is suggesting that it's going to be possible to, after delivering a severe military defeat on Russia, occupy it and transform its political system. So we are faced with a much, much longer, slower, and more painful process of transformation before we arrive at a country that is recognizable a modern state. Thank you. Leon Kossos uh, from the Center for Criminology and Social Legal Studies in USP. Um, thank you so much for this uh, uh, deep and excellent talk. It's uh, really convincing that it's it's a war on everybody. And my question is about the systemic causes of this war, because actually in Soviet times, the idea of war with the West was deeply embodied into the ideology. Am I right that to your point, that actually the cause of this war is unfinished process of desanitization, that it was not deep enough. And, this, and as a result, we have this uh, actually mm, uh, coming again idea of yeah, uh, war with the West. Broadly speaking, yes, but I wouldn't call it de-Sovietization because the attitudes that are driving the current war <laughs> are not Soviet, they are Russian. If you look at President Putin's explanation for the renewed onslaught on Ukraine in 2022, he is talking about the Soviet period as the initiator of all the historical mistakes that he wants to correct. He says the problem is that it was the Bolsheviks who set up these national republics on the territory of the Russian empire, which now have transformed into independent nations where nationalities are free and able to determine their own futures, which according to President Putin, is a deeply unnatural state of affairs and a historical mistake that needs to be corrected. So his explicit agenda is a return to the Russian and the subsuming of countries, not just like Ukraine, but also like the Baltic states, if you follow the argument logically Finland, Poland, so that they are no longer independent nations and no longer have the pretense to being independent nationalities and separate from Russia. So again, it is a far deeper, far older, far more atavistic urge that is driving them than anything that can put a Soviet label on. It isn't his motivation. It's uh, the issue that in 1990s and the beginning of 2000s, when actually, especially in 2000s, when Russia had an economic success, uh, Putin uh, declared the war in 2007 when it was peak of economic success. And before that, there was no idea of uh, war again, right? Therefore, it, it seems a likely motivation and the cause probably in some other area. I, I have to disagree with you. And the reason I disagree with you is because 2007 was nothing new. The only thing that startled us, uh, Russia analysts in 2007, when Putin made his Munich speech, was that it surprised everybody else because they had been saying this all the time. This was not a new idea. It had been gathering force as Russia gathered strength. The capabilities were getting stronger. The intent was always there. 
<clears throat> Russia was talking even in the early 1990s at a time when it was written off, either written off as a basket case and incapable, or it was assumed that this was now a sudden modern new state that had emerged fully formed into a living democracy and therefore could coexist with its neighbors. Either way, it was not going to pose a threat to the countries around it. And yet, Russia was busy waging small wars around its periphery at the time, which most people simply failed to notice. Because that aspiration to be the hegemon, that aspiration to be in charge of those territories around was constant. The only reason it was not noticed in the West was, first of all, it did not fit into Western conceptions of what Russia now was. And second, because Russia was weak, it did not have the capabilities to actually deliver on its intentions. But look what happens immediately on the, the influx of enormous wealth into Russia in the middle of that decade, in the middle of the 2000s. Straight away, you get an uptick, not only in the funding that's going into the military, but also in the campaigns against the West, because now they feel strong enough not only to expend resources on delivering those campaigns, but also to suffer the consequences if there are any. So the 2007 speech was not the beginning of a process. It was a long way down this track already. And the underlying assumptions about Russia's place in the world simply never went away because there was not the de-Sovietization that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, add something here, and uh, perhaps the former question that we go to the chair's privilege. Um, systems are important. Local culture is essential. Perhaps Darren will argue that it took 60 years to change the local culture. But Personality, leaders also do make a difference. When Yatsa came in, Yatsa has, has had very bad press in the West, some of it uh, deserved. But Yatsa was one individual who said uh, that uh, he cannot claim rights, he cannot build democracy in Russia if he denies it to other peoples, to the Baltic uh, states, to Ukraine, and so on. It was Yeltsin who said that he wanted Russia to become a member of the group of civilized states, by which he meant democracies. He may not have understood the Jacksonian democracy. Uh, now, he did pick Putin to succeed him for reasons of uh, personal and family survival, but leaders can make a difference. And I'm a little bit concerned about absolving Putin of responsibility for someone who laid on the worst instincts of the Russian people, who fed in that xenophobia and, and, and paranoia, who uh, did so for reasons of staying in power rather than some kind of sophisticated analysis. Are we attributing to Putin too much of a sophisticated understanding rather than someone who would do anything to stay in power? And if this is the cost, the Russian people will pay it. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Uh, so if, President Putin has used the instincts of the Russian people to achieve a certain end, even if it's only staying in power, that doesn't necessarily mean that he is not himself subject to those same instincts. I do feel very strongly, and this too is something that I went into in detail in the previous book, Moscow Rules, after we had been asked for so many years, do we have a Putin problem or a Russia problem, that it is a Russia problem because Putin is a product of Russia, not the other way around. It is not just one individual that is inventing all this stuff. He's instead, he's drawing on very, very deeply embedded societal motivators that, uh, that form the worldview that he is acting on. And the unfortunate consequence of that is that, uh, again, we hear the optimists saying that the end of the war in Ukraine must necessarily mean a change of ownership in the Kremlin, and that will do in Russia, but it will take far, far more than who is actually sitting on the throne at any one time to uproot that entire political system and all of the societal drivers that sustain it. There's a question from the gentleman then. Uh, hello, uh, I'm an anthropology student here and my name is Igor, I'm from Russia. And I wanted to ask what do you, like, if I understand you correctly, part of your claim is framing this for like, uh, at least to some degree, as like a uh, war of ideologies, like that, like uh, Russian ideology was like the liberal uh, democratic ideology of the West. And whether there is like, I 
purposely don't think that's uh, the reason, but I think this claim uh, in a way fuels uh, and contributes to the viewpoint that Putin himself tries to propagate both for Russian population and uh, for the uh, for the West and for other population because uh, he tries to use this narrative, for example, when addressing uh, developing countries or certain groups in uh, in the West, both left and right, saying that uh, he actually tries to like the neo uh, like he challenged the neoliberalism. He tries to, which is like total lies, but uh, he tries uh, to use this uh, narrative uh, and to gain support. Like he doesn't succeed much lately, <laughs> thankfully. And like whether framing in this way doesn't also help him in a way. Like what? Do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I actually think you're absolutely right. And I think it is, um, although there are ways in which you can describe Russia exporting an ideology as a tool, that is not the framework or whether it's, it's not the, the word that should be used to describe this clash of worldviews between Russia and the West. So you have two different things at, uh, at play. You have two very basic sets of assumptions about how the world works and what people's rights are within the world and by extension, what the rights of nations are within the world. Russia on the one hand and the West on the other. And then you also have that, um, that thing that we can refer to as an ideology that is instrumentalized by Russia to win friends and influence people, presenting Russia as the, the beacon for those people who disapprove of liberal extremism, see the decline of the liberal West, are looking back with nostalgia to a more authoritarian past, or indeed to the, the nasty dictatorships around the world that also need protection against their own population because what Russia has on offer is actually quite attractive for them. So there are, there are two distinct processes here and two distinct clashes. And uh, this comes back to the point we made earlier about the way in which uh, the offer is tailored for the different audiences. So um, absolutely, when we talk about it, an, an ideology, I don't think we should use that word to describe the set of assumptions and the set of innate beliefs that are actually driving Russia's campaigns at the moment. Okay. Yeah, please do. I just uh, also thinking that uh, just like the days before the war started and like weeks after, a uh, lot of like families, children of Russian politicians were and still are living in the West, uh, participating in this liberal, liberal democracy, like going to Milan for like shopping and going back <laughs> to Russia, like it's still going on. And in a way, uh, what do you think of, like, that's a very dominant view, like, for example, among like Russian opposition, that this narrative is not actually what, uh, like, people in power in Russia actually believe they just created because that allows them, like, to survive. Uh, but there is no, actually, this kind of, like, worldview that they actually are striving for. They're just, like, trying to, for example, uh, suppressing uh, Ukraine or Belarus or even war in Georgia is to show Russian population that no, 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 nobody can like escape the dictatorship rule. Yes, uh, it, it really depends which instrumentalized ideology you're talking about. But if we're talking about the, the kind of uh, Russia standing against li um, liberalism and Western democracies, then comparing that with the behavior of individual senior Russians and their families, um, we... <clears throat> I think that is at risk of applying standards of behavior and probity which have never had a place in Russian or Soviet political culture. Because um, we talked about retarded development. After all, this is a country where, where running the country is basically indistinguishable from owning it. And owning the country, by extension, tends to mean owning the people within it, which, is, which comes back to the subjects versus citizens thing, which is the reason why you can evict tens of thousands of people from the prisons and throw them into this front lines to stabilize the battle simply by soaking up Ukrainian bullets without counting the cost of lives. But once you arrive in a position of privilege or leadership, whether it's the old Soviet non nomenclatura, whether it's the aristocracy in Tsarist times, whether it's the new oligarchy, none of those rules apply to you. And you are part of the ownership class. And it is everybody else that is subject not only to standards of behavior, but also to rule of law because you are above that, because you are in the circle of the Tsar, more or less, and therefore you are able to operate with impunity. Does that fit? Yeah. I think my question's related as well. My name is Nan Berzelsky, and um, I'm an armature, Ukrainian armature. Um, 
So I'll just preface my question. I go back 30 years. I'm in Kiev, Kiev, speaking with a NATO officer. And I ask him, you know, what, what's the future? What's, what's going to happen? And he says, well, Russia will be a failed state. It, its people have no soul. I don't know if he meant religiously or otherwise, but they have no soul. They've lost it. So what about Ukraine? And he said, it remains to be seen. It will be a struggle. So that was 30 years ago, and it seems as if it's played out pretty much the way he described it. But when I hear you talking about the historical, the lack of historical events um, being the, the cause or the explanation for, you know, the Russian subject of today, I, I think, well, many of those things that didn't happen also didn't happen in Ukraine. And yet we have one country which seems to have gone down a certain path and another that is, as that NATO officer said to me 30 years ago, still struggling. And I, I just wonder how, how you would explain that, especially given the historical context. Partly because it goes back to the idea of nationhood within Russia, nations that have been colonized with Russia and the way in which to varying degrees Countries with a different political and social tradition to the Mongols had that political and social tradition uprooted and supplanted by what was imposed by Russia. And that, of course, often is a function of how long they were occupied and colonized by Russia before. So if you take the example for, of, uh, of the Baltic states, which by and large were left to, to cultivate their own political society for most of the time until the Soviet occupation, which only lasted 45 years, if you go, if you went to um, Tallinn or Vilnius or, or Riga in the very end of the Soviet period, you still knew that you were leaving Russia and entering Europe because they had not succeeded in eradicating all of the things that made the difference between the two. And the same is true to varying extents uh, within Ukraine. Now, if you think back to the um, the electoral maps of elections right up until really the middle of the last decade and that clear red blue split that that's shown so often as, as suggesting this is a country which should be divided between russian spirit and kids and, and europe and then map that to where those two those two parts of the country were before 1914 and the correlation between one part being russia and the other part being europe because it's the austro-hungarian empire is very very close and that is the reason why Ukraine, in a way, had a leg up. It had a leg up towards the uh, the democratic traditions that that unite most of the rest of Europe because it had access to them. It had a political system that was governed by them until it was snatched away by Russia. In the West. The Western part. The Western part, yes. Nicholas. Yeah, uh, sorry, my name is Nicholas. I'm a student here. Um, and I was I was, was looking for uh, a little bit more clarification on um, cyber warfare and kind of brief attention to this, but not necessarily um, seems to make it seem like uh, Western countries play a more defensive role when it comes to cyber warfare. But I'm interested in, in terms of like um, uh, how valid is it or um, Like, because I'm sorry, I didn't have this perfectly phrased, but I mean, you look at attacks like uh, the one in Iran, right? Um, uh, the Americans, they hijacked these centrifuges. Um, you know, how about or uh, Russia claims that America could do those kind of same things to them and like kind of justify this war in that way? Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah, just some more clarification on the side of our part. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that that does bring up quite a lot of um, quite a lot of different issues. First of all, like I mentioned before, there's so much of this that is unknowable. Like we only know about Stuxnet that you're referring to because of the spillover effects that were not intended. Uh, some of the Russian campaigns, similarly, we only really find out about because of the global impact because they're not so careful about containing the effects. And incidentally, one of the 
key tips from uh, one of these cyber experts I interview in the book is if you haven't installed a Russian keyboard on your system, do so now because so many of the tools, the offensive tools that they use actually deliberately avoid keyboards that they think are being used to type Russian. So it's a simple and straightforward countermeasure to get around some of these attacks. Um, whether Russia felt itself to be uh, genuinely uh, at risk or under threat? Uh, I think the answer is yes and no. And the reason for that is because in the Russian conception, it is not a cyber problem. It is instead an information security, an information warfare problem. And it is a holistic approach to the delivery of information as a weapon, of which cyber is just a subset. It's just the technical representation of information. So in some ways, the, the Russian perception of threat was entirely valid because this idea that I talked about before, that news and information and opinions from abroad are a threat, is actually perfectly real. Of course it's a threat. If you do not want your, your population to know what life is like in the outside world, because they then might aspire to the same prosperity and freedoms that they're saying elsewhere, then of course you ban the important possession of foreign books, because you don't want them to know about it. And that's been an absolutely consistent thread all the way through Russian and then Soviet, and now being reimposed in Russian history. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the, the strictly technical, the cyber development has gone through phases. We've seen Russia be extremely keen on, um, on cyber arms control and on treaties governing information security, including the use of, of cyber weapons. And that tells us that there was a genuine perception of vulnerability within Russia itself, because that's when Russia asked for arms control, control treaties in order to constrain a superior power, one that it feels that it is under threat from. Uh, that has waned. And I think one of the reasons why it has waned is, as so often happens, Russia now feels it is in a more comfortable position in regards to parity with other powers in terms of what effects that they can deliver. And of course, part of the, the reason for that is that they have found that they can deliver enormously damaging effects against Western countries without there really being countermeasures. So take, for example, the ransomware attacks that shut down the colonial pipeline in the US, and effectively nothing happens that's a realistic countermeasure to Russia. So they are finding that the boundaries of what they can get away with are shaped by the lack of Western responses. And so that dividing line between confrontation and open conflict has just been receding as they've been chasing it. More and more things that they can do that are overtly warlike acts but don't provoke a response. And so the escalation that we're so afraid of is actually happening all on one side. Yeah, very But isn't that a bit of an assumption that you're not doing counterattacks? Because again, with the Cold Rings coming there, sort of Starlink and the attack in Iran, like the ideology that the US was going by was we're going to implement something that's going to be very overt that they're not going to be able to realize. And it's, you know, it'll slowly have the introduction of uh, the order of. Uh, the climate of the Ukraine, right? So, in their, I mean, I mean, I guess it's kind of, I'm not really sure, but like, can there be counterattacks that we don't know of? I think I know what you mean, and yes, I think you're absolutely right. All of this comes with the caveat that unless we are actually directly plugged into those super secret rooms where this stuff is planned, we cannot know what is happening. We only find out about this stuff when it goes wrong. So, who knows how much of it is actually happening at the same time and it is going right? And there's there's a, a paradox there, and there's, there's a curious parallel with uh, with Russia's campaigns in an entirely different domain. If you look at the the murder campaigns across Europe and further afield, using Novichok, using a uh, uh, an incredibly lethal agent developed by the Soviet Union, we only know about the attacks that failed. <clears throat> we only know about the people who accidentally survived whether it's Sergei and Julius Trifal in Salisbury in 2018, who, instead of going into their home, uh, staying there after touching the door handle where it was smeared on, came out and collapsed in a public park so they could be helped. Alexei Navalny collapsing on an airplane and the pilot going against orders, landing. And the doctor who saw him first, guessing at the cause and administering, administering an antidote immediately without diagnosing. Emilian Gebrev in, in Bulgaria, who, on that day happened not to drive his car. So by the time he did touch the door handle, the effect of the toxin was attenuated and he survived as well. We know about them 
because they live by accident. How many more are there that we simply are unaware of? It is the tip of the iceberg. And one of the most chilling things that I found while researching this book was the interviews with the people who are in charge of carrying out murders on behalf of the Russian state. And the phrase that one of them used when trying to justify why they had failed to kill Navalny was, well, sometimes these complications come up in our work. In other words, it is everyday business for them to travel around the world killing people. Now, if you excuse me one moment, I'm going to see why my phone has been going crazy while we have been talking, just in case it's some online abuse from some of our viewers. I'm going to, I'm going to, I see that we have all been on this one, but I didn't see. Yeah, that. it's very suspiciously quiet on the actual uh, on the actual screen here. So, uh, oh dear, yes, Twitter's been quite busy. I don't think any of these is actually a question. <laughs> Okay, well, okay, there's some fan mail in there as well. Um, oh, yeah. Do okay. we have any questions at all? Yeah, I, can't, I can't see it on this one, but... Uh, uh, well, we do, we do, we do have a question. question. Well, yes, um, oh, yeah. I'm Patrick Luciani, a former student of Professor Roy. Um, you mentioned a while back at the beginning the, um, oh. the red lines at the West was reluctant to pass. And you, you said that perhaps the Russians need a significant military defeat to influence the public in Russia. How far are you willing to go, basically, to um, transgress those red lines? Would you attack the Russian army in Russia itself? Would you supply planes to the uh, jets to the uh, to the Ukrainian Air Force? Um, there's obviously a tremendous reluctance to even supply tanks. So how far would you go, and how far do you need to go to basically change the dimensions of this war. It really depends who you mean by you. I know you don't mean <laughs> me personally, but uh, is uh, it? <laughs> you in the, in, the, uh, in the very, very plural sense. Right. Um, should the Ukrainian armed forces be empowered to strike within Russia? Absolutely yes, because if we constrain them from doing so, we force them to fight with one hand behind their back. Russia can deliver capabilities against them that we are preventing them from responding to. And also, we are, as I mentioned earlier, buying into the Russian fiction that they are not at war. Should they provide, be provided with the tools and weapons to win the war as rapidly as possible? Absolutely, yes. There is not only a moral argument for doing so, but also a strictly practical one. Not just the, the inflection of the defeat on Russia that is essential, not just for our own security, but also for eventual transformation within Russia itself. Should we listen to what the Ukrainians say in terms of what weapon system they actually need? Yes, because they are the ones who are fighting the war. They are the ones who are developing the plans. They have the best insight into what their country needs, not only on the front line, but also to continue to function as a viable state. Because unfortunately, we have all of these precedents for countries that have fought themselves to a standstill and apparently enjoyed success on the battlefield, but known in their own decision-making circles that they cannot continue any longer and so have to capitulate. So all of these reasons mean that, yes, Ukraine should be supplied with the means to win the war because Russia will have the stamina to continue it for far longer than Western countries will. So bringing it to an early conclusion is far better than letting it drag on to be a forever war. Does that, however, and this comes to the root of your question, does that, however, mean that other countries should join in with the war on, on the part of Ukraine? I think the answer at the moment is no, but I also think, and this is something that I have urged over many, many years, now, and you've heard me say this repeatedly, we should not be so keen to say to Russia what we are not going to do. We should not be so keen to reassure Russia that this is never going to happen, because that immediately removes all of the worst case scenarios from Russian decision plan. It removes from the calculus everything that could go catastrophically wrong for Russia. And unfortunately, in the case of the lead up to the, the February invasion of Ukraine, we have a classic example of the disastrous nature of the Western messaging on this topic, saying that there is no military solution, leaves Russia free to pursue a military solution of its own, knowing that it's not going to be interfered with saying that there will be no Western troops in Ukraine to oppose Russia. 
immediately makes it so much easier for Russia to plan and to consider the risk factors that are involved. And then finally, not just saying, but actually doing. What's the final action that Western countries, including this one, take in the weeks leading up to the invasion to convince President Putin that he has a green light and it's all going to be okay? Pulling out the Western trainers, the US, the Brits, the Canadians from Western Ukraine in order that they don't get in the way of the invasion. If the opposite had been done, and if Ukraine had been provided with contingents of Western troops, even on a very token basis, similar to the ones that are in position in the Baltic states in Poland under NATO's enhanced war and presence program, and if it was made plain to President Putin that if he interfered with them, then there would immediately be precisely the conflict with Western powers that he has worked so very hard to avoid, I am absolutely convinced that the fresh invasion of Ukraine in February would not have happened. Instead, unfortunately, Western powers did the precise opposite. Just to follow up very briefly, the, the Russian reaction to something like that, what would it be? The, West, the Russian reaction to, to, to the final Korea eventual Russia. arrival of Western powers in the conflict uh, be defeated fairly rapidly. They would like us to think that this would be uh, the trigger for the launch of nuclear weapons because it would mean the end of Russia. And that, of course, is the doctrinal definition for, for so much of what uh, <clears throat> for use of nuclear weapons by Russia. However, Russia will be under no doubt that that would be absolutely catastrophic for the country itself, and not because of Western retaliation and not because of the damage it will cause in terms of countermeasures for a nuclear release, because again, Western countries, the nuclear powers that are within NATO, have effectively ruled out that there would be a nuclear response to a limited strike by, by Russia. Instead, it's the processes that that would unleash in the rest of the world, and what that means for security in Russia's region of further afield, and also for nuclear proliferation, because there would be no choice for any other power that found itself threatened by a bigger neighbor anymore, but immediately, once this nuclear taboo is lifted, to develop their own weapons as rapidly as possible. And that in turn has not only the, the immediate security implications for wars going nuclear elsewhere, which Russia seeks to avoid, but also it strikes the very heart of Russian exceptionalism. Because one of the key badges of them being a great power is the possession of nuclear weapons. That plus the security argument is why they've worked so exceptionally hard to try to constrain proliferation over time and actually being at times a fairly helpful partner in doing so, making sure that fewer countries around the world have nuclear weapons. They know that that would instantly be torpedoed along with so much else that guarantees the future of the world as soon as they use a nuclear weapon. I think that is an extremely unlikely scenario with one single exception. That is the reason why we describe this as a non-zero chance of nuclear use. That exception comes back to the impulse for destruction that we've seen from Russia. And the instinct that if they cannot have Ukraine, then nobody can. So if it were to be a simple fact of lashing out in order to destroy what Putin cannot have, I think in those circumstances, we should not be ruling out the possibility of nuclear use, despite all of the inevitable consequences for Russia itself. Sorry, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Oh, so is there someone up? No, I have a question also, but go ahead. Um, I'm curious to know why you think that uh, Russia wants to avoid a direct conflict with the NATO nation, particularly since it is quite eager to absorb the Baltic states, Poland, so on and so forth. Yes, obviously, we prefer to do any of those things without actually getting into a fight. And uh, <clears throat> the reasons why we we say that they have been trying so hard to avoid that open fight is because we've seen it playing out. We've seen it not only in the discussion by the thinking part of the the Russian armed forces about how catastrophic this would be, but also in the forms of brinkmanship that are de designed to deter Western countries from actually moving ahead and opposing Russia. So there are two, in a way, kind of 
you might think they're contradictory processes that are going on here. There is the, the process of provocation, but the end state, if you look at the, the Russian narratives that accompany all of, for example, the brinkmanship in the air that see around Russia's periphery in the preceding years, is to try to push Western countries further away from a position where they can interfere with Russia. That's what Russia has been trying to convince politicians of. It is all about distancing Western forces from Russia in order that, once again, Russia has a permissive environment, has the freedom of movement, can do what it wants without actually Western forces getting in the way. And that also lies behind some of the systemic transformations that we've seen in Russian armed forces themselves. The, uh, the means of long distance precision strike being designed not only to inflict catastrophic damage on the civilian infrastructure of a target country, but also to prevent Western militaries getting anywhere near by setting up uh, not only the, the capabilities, but also the perception that they cannot enter the zone without suffering catastrophic losses. This is what lies behind the, um, the term that was fashionable for probably getting on for a decade, A to A deeper bubbles, A area denial, anti-access and area denial bubbles. The idea that there are these rings on a map around Russian missile capabilities that Western forces cannot enter because they will suffer catastrophic losses because of Russian capabilities. Again, one of the exceptionally powerful Russian narratives that was pushed very hard across a wide range of, of different outlets and has left the lasting imprint on, on Western thinking. So those are just a few of the examples. Those are the few of the ways in which, in which Russia has indicated that push as hard as it likes in all of the other domains, it recognizes that the open military clashes with the combined power of the West would be fatal. Of course, that doesn't mean that they are not willing to go to a situation where if they thought they could pick off the Western power one by one, then that would be advantageous. But that, of course, relies on neutralizing NATO unity and ensuring that a political situation is brought about where they can deal with countries in isolation. Ukraine, unfortunately, was not in NATO, and therefore they thought could be dealt with in isolation. And now we see the tragic consequences. Um, I'm curious to know, you said that you don't feel that at least now is the time for uh, NATO troops to fight alongside Ukrainian forces. Uh, what is your, your particular reasoning for that? First of all, we are so far away from that because the possibility has been explicitly discounted. Now, that means that in between the current situation we have now and any possible eventual addition of forces from Western countries to the fighting in Ukraine itself, there is scope for a lot of leverage and persuasion to be delivered against Russia, because as soon as this becomes a palpable present threat, that means that it can influence Russian behavior in a way that has been completely unavailable up until now. So that means that there, if anybody has in their mind the eventual end state being Western forces fighting Russia in Ukraine or elsewhere around Russia's periphery, there are many stages to go through before then. Any one of those stages could potentially resolve the issue because if Russia has a phobia of these open clashes, then that is an incentive for Russia to amend its objectives and its behavior in order to avoid them. Finally, when it comes to the, the actual insertion, the eventual possible insertion, if such a thing were to happen, of foreign troops into the fighting in Ukraine, we have to bear in mind the political resilience and the stamina and the tolerance of Western societies for actually doing that. And there you have a significant break that is far more effective than the perceptions of escalation. Instead, it is the very real fact of whether Western countries are able to persuade their populations that this fight involves them as well. Able to convince them absolutely that Ukraine is the front line of the broader conflict that involves all of these other countries, not just in terms of the economic and political suffering, but also in terms of lives of their children lost on the front line. And that is a long way also from where we are at the moment. So there is leverage and there is potential in this idea. And I strongly have always urged that this should not be taken off the table and it should be present as 
a threat or a possibility in the minds of decision Russian decision makers because it hasn't been ruled out. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually going to happen. It has power even without being done. George Harris, um, again, a uh, question of the oligarchs. Um, uh, I think uh, the question is to, uh, to what extent are they beholden to Putin and to what extent is he beholden to them? And um, over the last several weeks, we've heard of uh, certain individuals falling out of hotel rooms, falling downstairs, falling off their yachts. Has there been, does that indicate that there's a deliberate campaign to eliminate some of these potential threats to, uh, uh, to Putin? I have not done the maths, but I'm fairly confident that uh, this is not a campaign of the last few weeks. It is something which has uh, is more prominent because it's receiving increased attention, but it is part of the steady background noise of, uh, of business negotiations in Russia. When it comes to the the stability of the system, the, the, the leadership of the ownership elite in Russia needs Putin as much as Putin needs them because he is the capstone of the pyramid. He is what holds it all together and keeps it stable. And that also means that the, the hopes that some of the, uh, the leadership figures might split away and could be induced to dissent uh, are also, I think, premised on some false assumptions, because unless and until the entire system is under threat, it makes sense for people to stick together in that stable pyramid. And so it will take for people to break away from that, the recognition or the, the, the yes, the coming to terms with the fact that their futures are more secure and more prosperous outside that system than within it. And that will only come at the very last moment before collapse. However, at the same time, it does appear that uh, the present trends within Moscow are hastening that collapse, not because of what's happening within the established structures of power, but instead because of the alternative centers of power that are being set up outside it. The way in which the private armies, most prominent among which are Wagner, but far from the only one, are now exempt from what passes for rule of law in Russia and can set up their own private fiefdoms with, for example, uh, the rights to carry out summary executions with the blessing of the state, but outside the state's judicial process to spring these tens of thousands of people from prison and pardon them despite not being state authority and so on. So you have a power structure which is numerous, heavily armed, and explicitly outside the rules. And I think that those, especially the major ones like Wagner, like the Kadyrovtsi, have set in train processes which Russia may find it very hard to control in the future. So this is one more question. Uh, you did mention in your book that uh, that you had Russia looks towards the West as it needs inclusion in the West. Uh, it wants to be a part of the West. And it's it's kind of ironic that it fights with the West but wants to be recognized as the West. Uh, so it's not a liberal democracy by any stretch of imagination. Uh, with this in mind, uh, sorry. Uh, so with this in mind, like, uh, and and uh, you did also mention during the talk uh, that the West could have stood up to Putin uh, and Russia. I mean, Putin is just an actor in the entire game. Uh, but the West could have stood up to Russia far more than it did in 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 the last twenty years, not even the last one year. Um, with this and 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 Germany did not the Macron did not in, in, in whatever way. Uh, what do you? What are your thoughts on the timing of Putin's aggression uh, or invasion of Ukraine at this point? When, I mean, militarily it wasn't ready, uh, though though his though his uh, uh, intelligence services might have said otherwise. Um, was that a part of the entire thing? Yeah. Um, first of all, Russia seeking to be part of the West. Yes. Russia wanted to join the, the top table community of nations, but on its own terms. And there was the fatal flaw in trying to draw Russia into the Western community of nations as that community did after the end of the Cold War. 
that the, the starting points for the understanding of how this was to work were so very different in that community and in Russia. Because Russia, it eventually became clear, wanted to join as a great power. In other words, have exemption from the rules that govern everybody else. And this sometimes reached comical levels of misunderstanding. So when, when NATO invites Russia to join in as an equal partner, as part of the, the cooperation arrangements, NATO thinks, yes, equal with everybody else. Russia thinks, no, equal with the whole of NATO. <laughs> and, and no, we're not sitting on the same at the same status level as Luxembourg. What are you talking about? <laughs> So it is. It was one of the ways in which the the assumptions of either side were so incompatible that they were unrecognizable to each other, and so they went unrecognized for a uh, for a great deal, uh, a great deal longer after that. And I'm sorry, I've mis lost this place. Yeah, second, I think the question was about the timing of timing. Exactly. Yes, thank you. Um, people think about. Uh, we've heard the invasion in February and uh, described as a massive miscalculation, but really it wasn't. It made perfect sense to launch the invasion at that time. And there were a lot of processes leading up to that. And I, I know we're a little bit short on time, so I'll, I'll try to try to um, put this in a shorthand, but all of Russia's 20 year campaign for getting ready for this moment was supposed to be ready. The military doctrine of the Russian Federation, the national security strategy of the Russian Federation all had term dates of 2020 as did the military transformation program. So Russia felt it was ready. And we saw this come through in the second half of 2021 with a series of actions by Russia that showed a completely different approach to its relationship with the West, which was now content to discard, and pushing for its own objectives regardless of the consequences. And I can list those for you in great detail later. But in November, November, December of 2021, the, the briefings that we were having behind closed doors were about how Russia has changed gear and it is now pushing for its preferred strategic outcomes and it doesn't matter what gets broken along the way. So put that together with the context of um, Russia also thinking, first of all, that it has a potent military tool that is now ready for action. Secondly, that Ukrainians don't really exist and they're just frustrated, slightly inferior Russians that are looking for liberation from the neo-Nazi clique that has seized power in Kiev, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And thirdly, that you've got the green light from the West. It all makes perfect sense. And so it will come in as enormous surprise to Putin when it didn't work almost as much of a surprise as to his poor benighted soldiers who rolled into Ukraine, not knowing where they were going, what they were doing, or most importantly, that people wouldn't be pleased to see them. And we have two. Should we, really, should we take these two? Uh, do, do you have just, just uh, right, can make it super brief. Uh, the question online from Susan Is there any level of mobilization and deaths of Russians that will generate an internal backlash? No doubt there is, but we're nowhere near that yet. And part of the reason for that is that this was recognized as a challenge by Russia a long time ago. The, the number of casualties is very tightly controlled information in Russia because they recognized as long ago as 2014 and the start of hostilities in Ukraine, that this was a societal challenge. And furthermore, that they had lost all of the control measures that were previously in place. So organizations like the Soldiers Mothers Committee, all of the other constellation of rights organizations could compare notes and arrive at accurate totals of how many people had actually been killed, which is the reason why you suppress that information, because it's a threat. And Russia has plenty of historical experience for why this has been a problem. The most obvious example being Afghanistan, where not only are the casualties coming home with uh, the ability to exchange information and find out what the true picture is, is a political challenge, but also you have the returnees as a political force later in Russian society. And this too is something that is gonna be a destabilizing factor in Russia after the war. And secondly, there's an anonymous question. Is there a possibility that a palace coup could overthrow Putin and sue for peace against Ukraine? Well, we can always dream. <laughs> <laughs> I do not see any indication from the outside that there is the recognition within Russia's ownership structure that this has been a catastrophic blunder. It's possible that there is somebody in there biding their time, building their networks, trying to convince everybody that the future of the country is more important than the future of their own families and fortunes within the stable power structure, and they might eventually attempt to launch a coup. But for the time being, the only opposition that we hear to Putin and the only 
dissenting voices that we detect that are in any form of in a position of power to do something about it are the ones that are critical of the conduct of the war, not of the war itself, are the ones that are calling for even more harsh measures against Ukraine, even less restraint in prosecuting the war, and better and faster genocide warned against, warned, waged against Ukrainians. So my suspicion is if there were to be a palace coup of that kind, unfortunately, it might be in the other direction. Okay. Hey, perhaps we should conclude here because it's just about five o'clock. So let me just say in, in uh, closing and in thanking uh, our speaker that what uh, uh, Kate Charles presented, and I think it's very important to look at his book, uh, it is a picture that is exceedingly bleak, but it is vital to understand. It is an inconvenient reality that we, not just leaders in the Western world, but the populations, everyone, need to appreciate what we are facing. If we are to deal with it, if we are to move beyond this kind of reactive policies, if uh, we are to select better leaders who can actually lead rather than lead from behind, we have to appreciate all of these factors. Whether you accept every aspect of it or not, there are key elements that we cannot avoid. And the sooner we uh, based that uh, inconvenient reality, the better it is. So I think uh, uh, what was said today is profoundly sensual, and I want to thank our speaker for coming, for taking all those questions, and uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah.